Welcome back to Dishonored. We just finished the Knife of Dunwall DLC, so now moving on to the third and final one, the Brigmore Witches, which for some reason I always want to pronounce the Brigamore. Brigamore Witches, but there's no I there or anything. It's Brigmore. Brigmore. A safe game of the Knife of Dunwall has been found. You can use your progress on the Brigmore Witches. You will retrieve your equipment and powers. Which progression do you want to use? High Chaos, which I guess is our old save. Yeah, it was pretty high chaos. <laughs> or a new game. You will retrieve your equipment and powers. So, uh, does that mean we're playing as Doubt again? I mean, I guess we're going to continue what we started, right? High Chaos. Yeah. Yeah, it looks like we are continuing as Dowd. Gonna continue on as Veteran. Overwrite the previous Brigmore Witches autosaves. I don't have any previous Brigmore Witches autosaves. He knew. The black-eyed bastard knew that when my blade stilled the Empress's heart and delivered her daughter to the Lord Regent's men, Everything would fall to pieces. He watched me do it anyway. And now the world's gone mad. Plague grinds the city down. Corruption rots. A mad killer roams the streets by night, seeking revenge. The overseers have stormed my hideout in the flooded district. And I'm in a strange duel with a mad witch named Delilah for the fate of the Empire. I'd say I was being punished, but I know that the world doesn't punish wicked people. We make our choices and take what comes. And the rest is void. I can't say I wasn't warned. It's been months since I killed the Empress. But it feels like only seconds ago, I heard her yelling for her daughter, Emily. Corvo's face going slack with shock. And somewhere in my head, the outsiders laugh. Come to collect on our debt? Did you ever think you deserved to lose your Empress? That a better man took her life, while you gaped like a fool. Come on, Corvo. Prove me wrong. <gasps> oh, I'm actually playing. Defeat Corvo Atano. Ooh. <laughs> you requested. He's waiting for you below. There's a lot of blood around here. We did kill a lot of people, taking back our flooded district hideout. What if these books are going to be the same as when we were last year? I, I don't know. Hold on. Let me take a quick look around. Like, I remember there are a lot of books here. Cobbled bits of bone. I think that's new. Yeah. Okay, let's read this one. It's got an intriguing name. Excerpt from a journal covering various occult artifacts. 
Oh, by the way, I should mention, uh, I'm on the tail end of a cold, so that's why my voice is kind of stuffy and weird. They say my mother was a witch, but the truth, as is so often the case, depends on perspective and your place in the world. She relied on poisons made from exotic herbs and the blowfish that live in the reef waters near Pandicia. Her power originated in hallucinogenics delivered through guile or by force to those who crossed her. There was an unusual intensity in her gaze for certain, but it came from within, not from the outsider. It's what happens to anyone pushed to the absolute edge of sanity and survival, who stays there for years, then returns to walk among the sheep in so-called civilized society. My mother was crafty, but if it was anything more than powders, hidden knives, and guile, I never saw it. Like they tell children, some of those truly touched by the black-eyed bastard can move through the space between rooftops like a sparrow. Others command armies of rats or poisonous flies as easy as they wriggle their fingers and toes. The overseers are right to fear us, to warn the common folk to stay near their homes at night and keep their families close. But there are other ways his influence manifests itself. Those who serve may share in some of what I can do, and I suspect it's the same for Delilah Copperspoon's coven. Then there are those who can craft runes and charms. The old woman across town, they call her Granny Rags, she carves and polishes the bones of whales, stringing them together and opening them to the void until they moan like the fever sick on a cold night. I found a few of her talismans, and with each one I touched, a tiny piece of me departed and settled in with her. What does she gain? A longer life? Some other kind of power I don't understand? The making of such things is beyond me. I've known four people in my time who carried the mark of the outsider, but I've known dozens more who wanted it, who stood at night in stagnant ponds or begged with the dust blowing through graveyards. People who gutted farm animals or burned the flesh of men thinking it would call forth the void. I met a dying man once who had collected runes and charms for years. He crushed them all into powder, made a paste and ate them, thinking he could gain whatever magic was in the things. His death was long and painful. I also knew a woman from Karnaka who would trade for charms and other bits of whalebone. She cracked them apart and fused them back together, then sold them. I bought one of these corrupted charms that she swore would cause sharp metal to break on my skin. And it worked. But each time it did, one of my teeth turned black and fell out. After the third time, I gave it to one of my men. Now when he smiles, it's all bleeding gums, and I wonder what parts inside him are turning black. <laughs> Jesus Christ. Did you warn the person you gave it to? Sometimes I ask myself, without these gifts, would I be a man to fear? Would I be called the Knife of Dunwall, with my name whispered through the markets and the alleyways, the high towers and drawing rooms? I'd like to think so, but it really doesn't matter. As long as I bear this mark... I'll use whatever craft I have to force my will on the world. The harder trick is undoing what I've done. Regency and emergency powers. In a time of political upheaval, there are provisions in place for a staged transfer of power designed with three goals in mind. The first is the minimization of incentive for coup. There is no predetermined person or position within the government that is scheduled to take on the mantle of regency during a time of crisis. Instead, a regent is chosen by parliamentary accord. This serves to avoid promoting a path of derelict ascendancy, and to discourage those who would scheme for such a turn of events. It is the assumption of our governing documents that such a legislative body will always have the wisdom to see through would-be usurpers. The second is the assurance of stability for the commons during and after the transitional phase. During an interregnum, while a regent rules the land, there are categories of laws and decrees that cannot be altered without a majority vote from Parliament. Thus, daily life for the people will not change dramatically when during the time of regency, or shift drastically once a proper heir takes up the throne. Third, and perhaps most important, is that a worthy successor is found. In order to rule out hasty action and to maximize stability, there will be no term limit or duration applied to the period of regency. Historically, rash decisions have been greatly contested, resulting in extended political turmoil or outright conflict. 
When the proper heir is found and the position is filled by someone worthy of the role, all others will fall in and provide their support. No term limit. That is not a good idea, I don't think. Um, guide to port cities across the Empire of the Isles. Potterstead, Gristol. A small town, but the locals are charming and the ale is unmatched. Be certain to visit during the month of winds for their pennant festival. Dunwall, Gristol. Notes on the capital city could fill a dozen such volumes. All delights exist in Dunwall if you've got the coin, and all miseries if you're broke. Unless you're well connected through someone in Dunwall Tower, one of the key families, the City Watch or River Patrol, make sure your permits are in order. Otherwise, you're likely to have your cargo seized by the port authorities for any reason they care to concoct. Call Kenny Morley. While the harbor master here is particular about the kinds of goods you're carrying, the rest of the town is more lax. Be sure to visit the Inn on the Rock for the best mutton stew in all the aisles. Yarrow Tivia. The coal here will snatch the breath from your lungs, but it's met in equal strength by the civility of its well-mannered citizens. The cozy taverns are kept warm by their famously crafted iron stoves, though the northern food takes some adjustment. Bejeweled aristocrats laugh and drink side by side with weathered, leathery-skinned farmers, clapping one another on the back until the dim hours. It's hard to make a friend here or to truly understand the worldview of the native-born, but once you do, you'll have a friend for life. Calero Circonos. This city is crowded in the warmer months, and for a good reason. You'll find yourself shoulder to shoulder with scantily clad locals and foreigners on holiday, pale skin burned pink by the sun, which somehow seems larger and brighter in Circonos. The food in Colero is a shining example of Circonan cuisine, and there's always music, always dancing. Hand rolled on the steps of tobacco shops, the cigars are of course fresher than the ones you've had shipped to other parts of the empire. Karnaka Circonos, the jewel of the south at the edge of the world. The city is bustling with industry after a wave of settlers from Morley and an influx of wealthy trading companies from Dunwall. Everywhere you go in Karnaka, there are new ideas, hybrid forms of music, groundbreaking theories of natural philosophy, and even extravagant delicacies made by mixing ingredients from all the known cultures. The locals work tirelessly for their coin, welcoming the elite from across the aisles. I wonder how many of these places we're going to visit, both here and in Dishonored 2. Did we read this? No, we read those those three. It's a lot of reading, but the writing's really good. Excerpt from a pamphlet published in response to the plague. Dunwall, the seat of power in the known civilized world, the Empire of the Isles. It's our great capital, and it has been brought low by vermin. The very thought galls. We are faced with the reality that our once great city is in a state of shambles, and the few remaining domiciles in any habitable condition are the estates of those wealthy enough to ward themselves against that reality. A city cannot continue to thrive, populated by only the upper classes and their cloistered sycophants. Even if the plague were gone tomorrow, in its present state, Dunwall doesn't have enough hardy people of working age to return the city to everyday function. We must find a way to attract more residents, which requires removing the cloud of fear brought about by the current regime. The Lord Regent and his lackeys are bad for business, my friends. So it falls on us. A plague and a tyrant must be overcome. And after that, we must undertake a third miracle, turning the screws on the obscenely wealthy forcing them to pay back into the place that has given them their privileged lives. It is the powerful and fortunate who must pay for the rebuilding of Dunwall, even if the poorest will bear the stones and timbers of reconstruction on their backs. All this must happen for the dormant machine of commerce to restart. Without that, we are all forfeit, and the greatest city of our age will be lost. There really is like a perfect point, isn't there, where at least for me when I'm recovering from a cold there's like a good day or two when my voice is recovering where it sounds kind of amazing it's like I don't know I guess deeper so it falls on us a plague and a tyrant must be overcome 
And after that, we must undertake a third miracle, turning the screws on the obscenely wealthy like... <coughs> Excuse me, my voice sounds kind of epic. There's so much here. I mean, it's our hideout. No wonder. Blueprints. We're gonna be doing a lot of reading. Oh, there's I, I see four books in front of us. <laughs> Get ready. Here we go. Excerpt from a longer band work on supernatural ritual. It's said that we should not sully our hands when combating the forces of the void. My studies have been deemed heretical by my brothers, but the rewards have been invaluable. I've harnessed the same energies employed by the outsider and his accursed followers while avoiding their corruption. I will prescribe a twofold method in this text. Indirection. As the unwholesome powers of the outsider use living flesh as a conduit, we can avoid being tainted by using the flesh of others instead. Containment. By using channels and barriers, we can focus these void energies in a raw state, shielding them from the perverse perspectives of the outsider. Thomas's Journal A recent journal entry written in a careful hand. Our troubles began with a name, Delilah. A mystery given to Dowd by the face he sees in his dreams and whose voice he hears when kneeling at the shrines hidden in the lost parts of the city. None of us have ever heard this voice, but we know its power. It spoke to our master, telling him of his coming doom and saying that solving this riddle was the only way to escape. We knew nothing of Delilah, except that we found a whaling ship by that name, a tenuous connection. That where the outsider's word is concerned, there are no coincidences. We discovered the ship was named after a woman who once walked the halls of Dunwall Tower with Jessamine Caldwin. Later, she became a painter, an apprentice of Sokolov himself, until she snared an aristocrat patron named Arnold Timsch. We met with Timsch's niece, who offered us information on Delilah in exchange for eliminating her uncle. Removing aristocrats was our specialty, so our master agreed. With barrister Arnold Timsch gone, his niece divulged everything she knew. Delilah was much more than a painter, and she was hiding in the old Brigmore Manor outside the city. But by then we were too late. Delilah anticipated our threat. For some time she had been working her corruptive influence on the best of us, the assassin Billy Lurk. Delilah turned Lurk against us, and together they sold us out to the overseers. When we returned to our hideout in the flooded district, we were swarmed by gold masks and hounds. But doubt is quick and wise in our trade. In the end, he kept us alive, though there were losses. Now our resources are strained. Some of the men are grumbling. I see the strain on Doubt's face. Killing the Empress, handing over her daughter, those are not easy burdens to bear. And Lurk's betrayal weighs on him heavily. His sleep is troubled by curses and shouts. Now we make preparations to strike back at Delilah. She's planning something in Brigmore, something that affects everyone in the Isles, and she will be expecting us. Like our master, she shares her gifts from the outsider with those who follow her. How many are they, I wonder? I have no secrets from my master. My loyalty is without question, but I fear these may be the last days of the Whalers. Perhaps the last days of Dowd. Excerpt from a volume on Sir Conan Geography and Culture. Sir Conos, the jewel of the South, is best known for its warm winds, spiced foods, and endless beaches. While the city of Calero sees the heaviest flow of travelers from across the isles, Karnaka, on the southernmost edge of the known world, is preferred among the elite of the empire. It's said that a month spent resting beneath the sun on the beaches of Sirkonos, or within one of the rural villages, can cure most maladies. 
Travelers bring back recipes and styles from the South, and the dances that all Circonans learn in their youth are favored in Gristle for their sensuality, copied by the fashionable aristocracy in the capital city of Dunwall. The only persistent trouble in Circonos originates along the string of tiny islands stretching away from the mainland to the east. For generations, pirates have hidden among this archipelago, raiding traders passing between the isles and, more recently, attacking whaling ships returning with rich stores of oil. The Whalers, excerpt from a journalist's report on organized criminal activity. One gentleman of advanced age swore that his brother had been taken by the Whalers, a notorious gang associated with a man called Dowd. According to Peter Mansfeld, his brother Radoff was proud of working with the Royal Spymaster's Responsible Citizens Group, feeling no shame in reporting on what he perceived as shady dealings by his rivals at the fish markets. But this might have been the source of his trouble. On the sixth evening of the Month of Hearts, Radoff came storming into Peter's home, white-faced and panic-stricken, claiming to have been chased by a group of ruffians wearing the leather suits and vapor masks used by the men working in the whale oil factories. Peter gave him supper and drink, sending him on his way later in the night, after which Radoff was never seen again. This I think we read. Yeah, sorry if we've read some of these. It's been a little bit since I played the previous DLC. That's the only one I recognized. Thomas finished his scouting run. When you've talked to him, I'll give you the latest word from inside the prison. one rune. So yeah, are we continuing with the exact same abilities as last time? Mostly, but not quite. Pull is new. Pull inanimate objects towards you from a distance. Consumable items are used or stored immediately. Um, tips. Pull can silently disable a security system if used on the whale oil tanks powering the device. Ooh, yeah. And then for level two... You can pull living things and bodies towards you from a distance. Hmm. Uh, while suspended in air, enemies are vulnerable to lethal and non-lethal takedowns. Whoa, that sounds really, really good. I, I guess I want to save up all my runes for that. One of two runes. There's one more somewhere. Wait, did we read that? I think we read this. Yes. Got a corrupted charm over here. These aren't enemies, right? These are our own people? Yeah. Corrupted Bone Charms. Corrupted Bone Charms are powerful bone charms that come with a cost. Locate them, like normal bone charms, by listening for the song they admit, uh, emit, or with the Void Gaze power. Yep. Gonna turn our teeth black. Your max mana has been... Wait, is that the one? Oh, it doesn't have any of our bone charms equipped. But we still have all of our old bone charms, so I gotta select some. Yeah, what's the corrupted one? Ah, this one. Benefit, enemies have a high chance to miss ranged attacks. Penalty, you are more visible to enemies. More visible? No. That's not something I want to use. Max health? And sure. Hmm... You move forward slightly faster while in stealth, stealth mode. Having your weapons out doesn't slow you. You find ammo in greater amounts. 
Max mana has been slightly increased. And one more. Drinking from fountains recharges a small amount of health. Teachings again. Forget it. Dowd's getting older. He's getting strange. And if no one else will take him on... Don't even think it. You want to wake up dead? Hmm. Starting to get some dissent. Our group is falling apart. The Knife of Dunwall, A Survivor's Tale. From a street pamphlet containing a sensational, sensationalized sighting of the assassin Dowd. Gentle reader, be assured that your coin is well spent today. What you read here may one day preserve your life and your sanity. No one has seen the knife of Dunwall and lived to tell of it. Until now. The sun was setting a bloody stain against the sky, silhouetting the charred ribcage of the slaughterhouse. The stench of burned meat, the flesh of men and whales, soured the air. Doubt erupted from the ashes and timbers, his body wreathed in flame and rent with injuries that no mortal man could have survived. His shadow stretched out before him on the ground, and it revealed his true nature, a horned thing warped by heresy, a shape too terrible to put into words, my gentle readers, a sorcerer from the void without question. I could hear the moans of the dying workers beneath him in the rubble of the slaughterhouse, but he did not even pause to acknowledge their plight, for his heart is colder than Tivian ice. Instead, he let out a guttural howl of victory, the shock of which snuffed out the life of those poor dying workers. <coughs> and then he bounded away, moving from roof to roof back toward the streets. And this was where I thought this chapter would end until I heard the music. The grinding metal music of the overseers echoed from the nearby alleyways, and I knew there would soon be a fight. With only my sense of duty to the fallen citizens of Dunwall to keep my fear from overtaking me, I inched closer to the mouth of the alley for a better vantage. A brave contingent of overseers had captured one of Dow's lieutenants lurking in the alley. He or, or she, for I could not tell beneath the thick leather of the industrial whaler suit, was prone and tied with sturdy ropes, surrounded by overseers. But their fixation was ultimately their undoing. Doubt fell from above, moving through the air as easily as a falcon. I swear it upon my spirit. Without sound, he glided down among them, and the music maker was the first to die as Doubt tore the man's head from his shoulders. The wretched song faded in a discordant wail. Then I watched as the most notorious assassin of our time became a flurry of leather, metal, and blood, deflecting bullets and sword blades with ease. The last overseer, no doubt consumed with terror at seeing his brothers fall so easily, sank to his knees and begged for mercy. Doubt spoke a single word that made my entrails squirm in my belly upon hearing it. The overseer shrieked like a madman until his mask split in two, as though struck by some hammer and chisel, and a stream of blood gushed forth from the crack, bathing Doubt's boots. I closed my eyes at that point too overwhelmed to witness any further atrocity. I could only hope that if that foul heretic discovered me next, my life would end swiftly. But when I opened my eyes, Dowd was nowhere to be seen. That was the last I ever saw of the Knife of Dunwall. So heed my warning, gentle reader. Should you or anyone you love witness some misshapen shadow fall across your path, or should you hear the slightest rumor of dark words whispered from the rooftops, then flee, flee with all haste. This will hold while we're away. Anything short of cannon fire. Let's hope it won't come to that. You did right, sir. That witch had to die. That witch. 
was twice the fighter you'll ever be. I get the feeling we could have chosen to not kill Billy Lurk at the end of the last DLC. The Royal Spymaster. I think we've read this. I'm not sure. I feel like I've maybe read that. Dowd blew up a whole slaughterhouse. Where we get the whale oil. Won't that irritate the Lord Regent? Indeed. We could turn Dowd in. Split the reward. I'm literally right here. Go quietly. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you get out of here. They fought a brave fight. Idiots. Maybe their deaths will teach the living. The Abbey never changes. I found Lizzie Stride. Getting her to lend us her boat will be a bit complicated, however. She's in Coldridge. From what I hear, they've got enough on her to hold her for about a thousand years. Excellent. Lizzie has enemies inside Coldridge. If we play this right, she'll be begging to do business with us. Ready to leave, sir? Or should I wait? Uh, I don't, there's probably more, but... Let's go. I have all the runes, that's the most important thing. Yeah, and I got three, 300 out of 500 coins, so... Pretty good. Hey, I didn't kill anyone. Hoo-hoo. Security at the prison has increased because of Corvo's recent shenanigans, is what it just said. Delilah doesn't leave Brigmore Manor anymore. She doesn't have to. Which means I have to come to her. The manor's upriver, far out past the quarantine line. I'll need a ship. I've lived in Dunwall's underworld a long time. I know the players. Gang leaders, madams, corrupt officials. But what I need is a smuggler who knows the river. Someone I can trust. It's a reflection of Dunwall. Or perhaps myself. That after all these years, the best choice I have is Lizzie Stride. And Lizzie Stride is in jail. Network of Spies, uh-huh. We already know that from the last DLC. Unlocked improved armor, arc mine capacity. Some other stuff. Hmm. We don't have that much money in total, but we probably keep our old inventory. Actually, no, we don't, because we definitely had a ton of rewire tools, but now we have none. <coughs> Excuse me. Ugh. Two out of 15 sleep darts? That will not do. Yeah, I'm gonna max that out. Uh, I guess I'll buy... Well, what is there for favors? Oh god, we can't afford all this. Forged requisition orders allows your contact to deliver stun mines to the prison. Hmm. Misplaced rune? Yes, I want runes. Overseer Dowd, you are disguised as an overseer. An overseer has been summoned to Coldridge Prison. Your contacts will intercept him and send you in his place. Using this overseer's uniform as a disguise should fool the prison guards long enough to get you inside. Hmm. Tempting. But... Let's go with Forged Requisitions instead. I'll get in some other way. I'm sure there's some other way. Dowd, Lizzie Stride is in there. But we don't know where they're holding her. They're playing Overseer music from the loudspeakers. We couldn't get in. Why the music? One of their prisoners. A spy caught at Dunwall Tower. The guards have sent for Overseers to investigate. I'll be back with Lizzie Stride. Stay hidden. 